We're just going to start with worship. Will everybody stand and worship with us this morning? Remember those walls that we call sin and shame They were like prisons that we couldn't escape But He came and He died and He rose Those walls are rubble now Remember those giants we call death and grave they were like mountains that stood in our way But He came and He died and He rose Those giants are dead now This is our God, this is who He is He loves us This is our God, this is what He does He saves us He bore the cross Beat the grave, let heaven and earth proclaim This is our God, King Jesus Remember that fear that took our breath away Faith so weak that we could barely pray But He heard every word, every word This is who He is, He loves us. This is our God, this is what He does, He saves us. He bore the cross, beat the grave, let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God, King Jesus. Who pulled me out of that pit? He did, He did. Who paid for all of our sin? Nobody but Jesus. Who pulled me out of that pit? He did, he did. Who paid for all of our sin? Nobody but Jesus. Who rescued me from that grave? Yahweh, Yahweh. Who gets the glory and praise? Nobody but Jesus. Who rescued me from that grave? Yahweh, Yahweh, who gets the glory and praise? Nobody but Him. This is our God. This is who He is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what He does. He saves us. He bore the cross, beat the grave, let heaven and earth proclaim. Jesus, He bore the cross, beat the grave, let heaven and earth proclaim, this is our God, King Jesus. How's everybody doing today? Did you catch that? This is our God. This is who he is. And this is our God who saves us. Well, did you see the new pulpit? My good buddy John made it, and he was, we were talking about it. I was thankful for it. And he said, um, it's a year in progress, but it sounded like he said, you're in progress. <laughs> no, it's a year of work in progress, but he said, you're a work in progress. And I said, well, thank you, John. God bless you. But you know what? That's biblical. 
In the old days of America and in other countries, they would actually have the pulpit like maybe 20 feet up there and he would look down the congregation, not like condescending, it's because they looked up to the word of God. In the book of Ezra, it says that they had a platform and he would stand and he would read the word of God. And it tells us in Titus that he has in due time manifested his word through preaching. And through preaching, we, we hear who God is. We hear we need God. We read that we are a work in progress, but he's given us everything we need to live a life of Christ Jesus, of, of victory and, and blessing. And man, we need to hear that. So I'm just blessed that we're in a church that does that. And so I pray that you would always continue to pray for anyone who's going to come and preach the word, whether it's up here or in any of our ministries, because that's what we want to do. We want to manifest the Lord through preaching. Amen? Well, let's uh, pray and let's dedicate this morning to the Lord. Father, we are so grateful that we are your children. And we are so grateful that we have your word that tells us about you. Because, Lord, we need you desperately, but we also want to be more like you. We want to have your characteristics in our life that you did, Jesus. We want to be compassionate. We want to be forgiving. We want to be loving. We want to be kind to people. We want to speak the truth in love. We want to help people. We want to be brave. We want to be courageous for the things of God, the things of, that are true in this world of ours, Lord, standing up, standing up for what's right. And we want to be known as your followers, Lord. So continue to mold and shape us into your image, Lord, being transformed by the renewing of our mind, Lord. And so bless this service today, the worship, the prayers, the fellowship that we're going to have later on as our, at our potluck, and everything that takes place here today, Lord. We're just grateful that we're your children and you love us. So bless everything that takes place here. May you be glorified by all we say, think, and do. We ask this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. He's always been faithful. 
all stay standing. Todd is going to come and read the script. Good morning, everybody. Hold on, I'm trying to bring this up real quick. I had it all set up and now it's not. No pressure, exactly. I'm glad it's King James Version, something I can't read. That's awesome. All right, Matthew 2. All right, good morning, church. So uh, uh, Pastor Marty uh, texted me a couple weeks ago and asked me if I would read. So he gave me the verse that he wanted me to read, and I just wanted to, wanted to qualify what I'm about to read. Um, the first verse he gave me, I read on it, I prayed on it, I talked to my wife about it, and I got nothing. I had nothing. It didn't relate to me at all. And I was really kind of upset, nervous, and like, what am I going to talk about? Um, and then Pastor Marty called me yesterday, said, hey, I really messed up. Uh, <laughs> this is the verse I want you to read, not that verse. I'm like, Thank you so much. And then I got that verse, and I got nothing. So <laughs> this morning, I was praying about it and talking to my wife about it some more. And I'm going to read it, and then I'm just going to go over what I actually came across or what I actually got out of it. So we're in Matthew uh, chapter 2, verses 13 through 20. Uh, and when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeareth to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt. And be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night, and departed into Egypt, and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I called my son. This is verse 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceedingly wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and all of the coast thereof. From two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men, then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, In Ramah was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted, because they are not. But when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeareth in a dream to Joseph, say, Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead which sought the young child's life. Again, I don't understand why I had to do King James, so I read it in multiple versions, and like I said, I prayed about it and prayed about it. And really what it came down to for me is just having faith, right? We don't know, like me having faith that this scripture was meant for me or meant for someone else out in the church. I just have to have faith that what God's plan for me is, I may not know it, but I have to have faith that he has a plan for me. And just like Joseph, he got woken up in the middle of the night and had to take his family and, and leave for Egypt, right? I don't know if that's meant for me and Mel and the kids to go to Egypt or not. I don't. But... I'm just going to have faith that he has a plan for me, and I need to believe that he has a plan for me. So that's it. Yeah. I just pull it down. Yeah. 
Good morning. Whether you are visiting us here today um, and you call Impact Bible Fellowship your home or you're visiting for the first time or you're new, we want you to know that we have prayed for you and that you are not here by mistake and that we are happy that you're here. So welcome. Um, with that, we want you to know that there is a resource table at the back of this room and someone's there before service and after ser service to help you. I was there this morning and I was just, I kind of walked through there and see what they have. And one of the things that they had there and I wanted to share with you was this paper to hand out, this card. And on here it says, pregnant with a question mark, unsure with a question mark, hope is here for you. On the back of this card, it says, your child is not a mistake. God has people to help you throughout your pregnancy and beyond. The, and beyond. the truth is that God loves you and your child in your womb immeasurably. And it goes on in the back. And there's a QR code. There's churches and organizations to help um, anyone that you feel led to give this to. So what a seed to be planted for someone who does not know that there is a God and that there is a child in their womb who God created for a purpose. So these are in the back. The other one here too is hope and peace. This is to invite anyone to church. On the back of this, it says, what is, your, what is the meaning of life? What happens when I die? Can I know God personally? And on the back, there's an invitation to impact. So I thought these were great. So I would just pick them up and leave them in your car, leave them in your purse, and that way they're available when God brings that divine appointment to you. If you are a mom um, that has lost a child and you are just looking for a place to find hope, please contact Brindle. Brindle. Um, she leads a grieving mom's study in her home at 7 o'clock on Tuesdays. And if we ever mention someone or we say, see Bart, see Melissa, see Bob, and you guys do not know who that is, please see anyone who's doing announcements, anybody at the resource table, and we will point you and introduce you to that person if you have not had the blessing of meeting them. Wednesday night Bible study and prayer meeting is this Wednesday, every Wednesday pretty much, at 7 p.m. in the library. When you guys um, attend, you park in the upper campus parking lot, and there are signs there to lead you to the library. Today is potluck day, it is food day. Um, after church, immediately. If you didn't bring anything, it's okay. We always have plenty of food. Please do not make that the reason why you don't come and fellowship with us. It's such a blessing. You just get to meet people, you know, and have conversation and food. Um, if you have kids in children's ministry, please go and pick them up immediately after church and that way our volunteers can get out to enjoy the potluck as well. Woven Passion, Woven Passion Week study continues this Thursday at 7 p.m. in the library in the Upper Campus as well. Men's Discipleship will meet this Thursday at 6.30 at the Calvillo's home. And you also have Love Life Prayer Walk this Saturday, February 24th at 8.45 a.m. If you have any questions, please see Melissa and Bob. And Biblical Citizens classes start Monday, April 8th, and that will start at 6.30 at the Calvillo's home. If you have any questions for that, you can see Bart as well, and he also has the voter guides available. They look like this, and he's in the back uh, right to the left when you exit. He can give you some of that as well. And with that, we, Bob has something to share with you. Good morning, everybody. Hi, Marty. How you doing? Um, since the inception of this church, since God planted the seed, we've continually prayed about ministries that the Lord wants us to be partnering with. And one of the doors God has opened, and it's, it's been a great door, is um, um, teaming up with Love Life. So we're, we're battling abortion. We're trying to mentor and help encourage uh, young women that maybe have had an abortion or considering and or maybe decided to keep the baby. So we are designated as a house of worship. I mean, a house, we're a house of worship too, but we're a house of refuge. We're a safe place for anybody that has um, gone through this um, this 
abortion process or a person that decides to keep their baby. And I'm pretty passionate about it. Next Saturday on, uh, by uh, Marcy Library, there's a little park there, Magnolia and Arlington. Our church is hosting a Love Life event. We'll be out there at 845. And all we do, we don't carry signs and we don't get radical. We just come along with Love Life. They have count, sidewalk counselors on each entrance of our Planned Parenthood down here in Riverside. And we worship, we have a worship time, we have a little message, then we just do a prayer walk and we stand across from Planned Parenthood and we pray and we worship and we just ask the God of heaven and earth to close that place down. To bring these women, uh, let them know who Christ is, how much he loves them, for them to keep this baby. I gotta tell a little story before I um, share this. I'm also involved in, um, I was asked to be on the, um, an advisory board for Love Life Regional with the, the guy that does that. And so we had a meeting uh, about a month ago and then that night, I woke up, I woke that morning, I woke up at three o'clock in the morning and all the Lord told me is they have no name. That was it. And so I contemplated that. I woke up the night, that morning. I actually couldn't go back to sleep for a while, and I just thought about that and prayed about it. They have no name. Every one of us here, we're identified by a name. Every one of us. These little babies don't get a name. They don't get that life. And uh, I'll tell you what, the more I get involved in this, the more I go down there and pray, the more it affects me, and the more I want to do to combat this evil in our society, which is so accepted. And it touches so many people. Um, it's hard. This is hard. It's, this is frontline Christianity. And that's why this church, Impact Bible Fellowship, is really involved in this ministry. That's why we are a house of refuge. I'm going to read the statement, but this is a place where a woman can come, a woman can come to be loved, can become to minister to, can come to be encouraged to be restored and um, lay their guilt at the, at, the, at the cross and let Christ take care of it. Every one of us here are broken people. Every one of us have sinned. Every one of us have things in our past that we don't want anybody to know. Every one of us. God forgives those sins. He says, as far as the east is from the west, there, that's how far. He says, I remember your sins no more. An incredible thing, but you know what? There are so many people that carry this guilt in their hearts. This remember from the enemy that he keeps bringing back what they did. And all of us can relate to that. Every one of us here can relate to that. It's when we learn that we can keep laying it at the cross, God forgives. And when he forgives, he forgets. And when he forgives, he restores. And um, that's what we're about. That's what this ministry is about. I challenge you, you go to one of these prayer events, one prayer walk, it'll change your life. It did mine. I'm ashamed to know that I've lived in the city so many years, I didn't even know Planned Parent where it was at. But I know where it's at now, and my goal is that we buy, buy the plywood to get that thing boarded up. That's my goal, so. This is our house of refuge statement. We are a house of refuge. This church, Impact Bible Fellowship, is a house of refuge. This applies to everyone in this church or people you know that need a place of refuge. You can come here and not, and you can be loved. And that's a great thing in our world. Here's what we believe. If you find yourself in an unplanned pregnancy, please know that being pregnant is not a sin. And the child you carry is not a punishment, it is a blessing. God is knitting this child in your womb. You may have made a sinful decision and that led to this pregnancy, or you may have been sinned against, but we want you to know that you are loved, and we will do whatever it takes to help you carry and care for this precious child before and after birth. We can never support or encourage a woman to have an abortion because the child you carry is made in the image of God, and it is intrinsically valuable and loved by God. You need to know how we will respond. Here's what we won't do. This church family, listen to this. This church family will not gossip about you. We will not, we will not shame you. We will not abandon you. This is a house of refuge. 
and we will not allow for the family of God to harm one another with the words or actions contrary to the love of God as revealed in his word. But here's what we will do. We will do everything in our power to remove whatever obstacles stand in the way of you having this child. There are people in this church ready to mentor you, throw you a baby shower, and connect you with the resources inside and outside our church, local pregnancy care centers. We also team up with Riverside Life Services. Chelsea goes to our church. My wife and I got to go on a tour a couple weeks ago. Awesome ministry. There are people in this church ready to mentor you, throw you a baby shower, connect you with resources inside and outside the church. We will also hold men accountable for living out their calling to provide and protect women and children. Finally, if you've ever had an abortion in your past, we want you to know that abortion is not an unforgivable sin. Whoever confesses and forsakes their sin finds mercy. If you have never gone through an abortion recovery Bible study, we will be happy to connect you to one so that you can walk in complete healing and freedom. This is the House of Refuge statement. It's on our website. This is what we stand for. This is what we're going to do. This ministry we're involved in. And we're going to have a short five-minute video, and then um, Marty will do his message. Thank you. When you're working at the abortion clinic, when you're inside, everybody is just like those crazy people on the sidewalk. And so you're told to just kind of avoid them and just go about your way. My name is Kawana Talbert. I moved to Charlotte 35 years ago and I was an office manager at the abortion clinic for 15 years. I started there as call center girl and I was just so curious to what they did inside of the clinic. So I just started easing my way into the clinic. After about a year, um, I began to working with the patients and I started training myself on doing ultrasounds. And then after doing ultrasounds, I began to get familiar with the staff and the physicians there and everybody seemed to take me. And so um, I got promoted to be the office manager. Every day I would come in and there would be pro-life people outside. Um, I didn't know who they were at the time, but they would always ask me, can we pray for you? You're gonna come out to me one day. Um, I hope that you want to come to the curve one day. And so that kind of just stuck in my mind every day. Why would these people come out here and be so strong about what they're talking about if I wasn't doing anything wrong. So one day while working there, my niece came to have an abortion and she and I talked for a long time and I said, if, you're, if you have doubts, you can always go outside. And I was telling her to go outside because there's normally, well, sometimes they would have an RV out there. Um, they would do ultrasounds and I figured maybe if she did an ultrasound and listened to the baby that she didn't want to have the abortion. And when she went out there, that's exactly what happened. Um, after talking with my niece and she got off the ultrasound van, she started talking to me about love life. For a while, I didn't believe anything she was saying, but mentally it started working on me. I, you know, I had it in the back of my mind that one day I would go to that curve, but I just, you know, I just guess I needed a push. And then my son got sick. I thought me working at the abortion clinic was blocking my blessings for him. I don't know what it was, but I would stand outside a lot and I would smoke my cigarette and I would listen to what they're saying. And then it was one time when they did a parade and they were all wearing blue shirts. I don't think I'll ever forget that. They were all wearing blue shirts and I'm like, wow, it just looks like heaven, you know? And I kept saying to myself, is this a sign? Is this a sign? You keep getting all these signs, you know? and I still didn't leave. As I was figuring things out, um, I began to not only pray with my patients, but send them outside. God was just working on me at that time. I just kept hearing his voice saying, you're gonna come out here with me one day. You're gonna come out here with me one day. Upon me leaving, I met a young lady who 
mainly was one of the reasons that changed my mind. Um, she was 13 years old and her parents wanted to, her to have an abortion. She didn't want to. Um, she was crying and I told her, you know, you can go outside, they have an ultrasound, they have people to help you with different things like that. And she said, my mom's not gonna let me go outside. And so I said, okay, well just tell you have to go to the bathroom. She went in the bathroom and then she came back out. She was too scared. So I took her into the back and just act like we were talking, but I sent her out the back door. And she ran to that ultrasound van. She got on there. I don't know who she spoke with, but she spoke with somebody and she said they prayed for her. And then when she came in there, she was crying. She was just adamant and told her mom that we weren't able to do her procedure. And so she went home and I know she didn't get an abortion. This was almost right at the edge of me getting through that threshold out the door. And then I went to work that next morning and it was Halloween. And I said, I'm getting the heck out of here. <laughs> and so I walked to the curb. So I was talking to Miss Vicky, and she said, you know, I may have somebody you want to meet. Can we just pray for you? And then I met Justin. And the joy that I saw within Justin was just amazing. And inside I said to myself, I want that kind of joy. And so that just really pushed me over the edge. So as I was leaving the abortion clinic, I felt so much weight lifting off of me. It was like I was having a shouting moment in church. It was like I was releasing so many different things. And so I said, what am I going to do? There the cooking began. Talked about it one day with Justin. He didn't even know I was cooking. And he was like, well, why don't you cook for us one day, you know? And I said, cool, you know, how awesome would that be? And from there, it's just been like, um, hey, you want to do a dessert? Or, hey, you know, just pouring into me. Just pour, love life began to pour into me. And they just began to say, hey, you know, here's an opportunity for you to spread the love through your cooking. Here's an opportunity to be you, I guess I would say. Um, and it kind of went from there. I'm hoping that by you hearing my story, by you eating my cookie, first of all, I hope that you enjoy the cookie. But I hope that by you hearing my story, you continue to support Love Life. You continue to stick with the Love Life family. Thank you so much for what you're doing. Please keep on doing it. It's because of you that I am sitting here today baking these cookies with love for life. Re oh, I am on. <laughs> Remnant and Haven, you are dismissed. Everybody else, please turn around and say hello to somebody.
Be 
Amen. Please remain standing. I saw you guys getting ready to sit down. We've got to read God's word first. Unless you're really, really hurting, sit down. But if not, stand up for the reading of God's word. We're going to be in Exodus chapter 1. We're beginning this new study. We're going to do the book of Exodus. But this first, this first message is called, Life is Precious, But Not to the Devil. That's what my friend uh, Todd was reading earlier. Um, Sorry about that, Todd, with the confusion. However, I told him New King James. I didn't tell him Old King James, but that actually added some little humor to it. I thought that was really good. But I don't usually do that. I don't usually give you a verse and then the night before say, oh, gosh, I was wrong. So, Todd, you were the first one, so you you handled it beautifully. So, anyways, Exodus chapter 1. Now, these are the names of the children of Israel who came to Egypt. Each man and his household came with Jacob. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher, all those who were descendants of Jacob were 70 persons, for Joseph was in Egypt already. And Joseph died, all his brothers, and all that generation. But the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly, multiplied, and grew exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and it happen in the event of war that they also join our enemies and fight against us, and so go up out of the land. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh supply cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew." And they were in dread of the children of Israel. Verse 13. So the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with rigor, and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage, in mortar, in brick, and in all manner of service in the field. All their service in which they made them serve was with rigor. Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, of whom the name of one was Shipra, and the name of another or the other Pua. And he said... When you do the duties of a midwife for the Hebrew women and see them on their birth stools, if it is a son, then you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, then he, she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the male children alive. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this thing and saved the male children alive? And the midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. For they are lively and give birth before the midwives come to them. Therefore, God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very mighty. And so it was because the midwives feared God that he provided households for them. So Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every son who is born you shall cast into the river, and every daughter you shall save alive. Father, as we look at this text, Lord... It breaks our heart that there's people like this in the world, Lord, that that would want to kill precious little children, little babies. Lord, I pray as I share this word, it would be your words, not mine, that you would increase and I would decrease. But also, Lord, help us to pay attention with intention. What are you saying to me? What does this mean to me, Lord? So bless this time in your word, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, Bob, does it seem like there's kind of an echo in my... Am I echoing? Okay, they said I'm echoing, so please fix that, 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 please, 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 please. So, check this out. In the very first, in, the, in my Bible, I have a, some of your Bibles, they have like maybe a little paragraph that describes the book you're going to read. This is what it says in Exodus. Listen to all the mention of the word birth, womb, family, birth pains, and infant. Exodus is the record of Israel's birth as a nation. Within the protective womb of Egypt, the Jewish family of 70 rapidly multiplies. At the right time, accompanied with severe birth pains, an infant nation numbering between 2 and 3 million is brought into the world where it is divinely protected, fed, and nurtured. Right off the bat, it is talking about family and talking about how life goes where, where generations give birth to other generations. And that's kind of what we're talking about here. This happens to be in the opening text of the book of Exodus. Exodus really means 
a departure, a going out. And one of the primary themes of this book is the children of Israel are in bondage and they're going to be t- taken out. They're going to have an exodus. That's the main thing that you see in here. See, God's people came to Egypt as a family in um, Exodus 41 to 50, 70, 75 people, and they left as a nation. It tells us in Exodus 13 and 14 uh, that they were, had 600,000 men that could fight. They were fighting age, 20 and old, older. So they, they figured with wives and children, they probably had two to three million people. Moses is the author of this book of Exodus. He is the main personality also, you have his, uh, his brother Aaron. But the main thing that we're going to look as we go through the book of Exodus, they're going to see that the children of Israel were in bondage for many years. And because of that, God's going to raise up a deliverer who's Moses. And then there's going to be what we have, the ten plagues in, 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 in Egypt. God's going to bring ten plagues on Egypt to get the people out. Then we're going to actually have Exodus. The people of Israel are going to come out And that's what Exodus is. They're coming out of Egypt. And Egypt is a type of the world. We have been called out of the world. So we're going to see that in here. We also are going to see the first Passover, which is a a, a type of Christ, the Passover when the firstborn was going to be killed unless you slayed your lamb and you put blood on the doorpost, the angel of death would pass over your house. That's what God has done for us in Christ. If we have the blood of Jesus in our life, if we accepted him as our Lord and Savior, the angel of death will fly fly over us. It won't affect us. We're going to go to heaven. We also have the parting of the Red Sea. That's symbolic of baptism, how after we get pulled out of the world and we become believers, we should get baptized. And I pray everybody here wants to get baptized. I was going to announce this next week, uh, that we're going to have baptisms uh, either before Easter or after Easter. And so next week... If you have not been baptized as a believer, you need to because God commanded us to. And we're going to have a sign-up list back there, but I'll I'll talk about that next week. Then we have the wilderness wanderings of the children of Israel, where uh, for 40 years they wander in the wilderness. And then the Ten Commandments, the giving of the law, we're going to read about that as Moses goes up to get the Ten Commandments from God. And then when he comes down, we have what's called the golden calf incident in chapter 32, where they are dancing around this, this, uh, this idolatrous calf and doing all kinds of weird stuff. But then we have the, the rest of the book talks about the tabernacle being built, the formal worship center where all the tribes would come around and the Levitical priesthood. So that's just a real quick flyover on what we're going to learn in Egypt, or I'm sorry, in, in Exodus. I got to get Egypt out of me, I guess, if I'm going to preach this right, huh? So Exodus basically picks up where Israel or where Genesis left off. Now these are the names of the children of Israel. Just talking about Joseph dying, and now it's talking about all these children of Israel that were in the land. But interesting, in verse 7, it says, But the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly, multiplied, and grew exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. God is what he's doing, is what he's doing, he's fulfilling the promise that he made to Israel. Well, actually, he made it to Adam and Eve in the garden. He also made it to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the birth of the Jewish nation, to be fruitful and multiply. God's chosen people were to live righteously and be a witness to the world. It tells us in Genesis 1.27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created him. He blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And that's exactly what's happening here. So, Who do you think hates the image of God? This is not rocket science. This is a very easy question. I'm not going to call you out. Who do you think hates the image of God? Yeah, the devil, Satan, right? This is what Jesus said about Satan. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he does not stand on the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. The two things that stand against life in this world is murder and lies. And that's what the devil is the father of both of those. He's a murderer and he's a liar. And here's, a, here's some of the lies that are talked about these days in, about abortion. First of all, they call it abortion. Abortion is like you, you're aborting a mission, like a military mission. When you're, you're not aborting anything. You're actually cutting a life short. And uh, it's murder. It's murder of innocent life. That's what taking uh, the life of a baby is. But that's what they call it. 
They say they're pro-choice, but actually they're actually pro-death because they don't promote keeping the baby. They promote you taking the baby. They're an advocate for killing the baby to choosing to kill it, not to keep it. And there's a bumper sticker I saw years ago. It says, aren't you glad your mom was pro-life? I always thought that's kind of a good one. They should put that on their sticker, on their car. They also talk about the women's right, never about the baby's life or the baby's death. And nowadays they talk about women's reproductive freedom. That's the big topic, to, uh, talking point they're going to use with these elections. I love what Mother Teresa said. It is a poverty to decide that a child must die so that you may live as you wish. Ouch. That's pretty painful, but, but actually very true. Another lie is they never affirm or offer abstinence or waiting until you're married to have sex to keep abortions from happening, though they call themselves Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood just recently had a video that's gone out that says that virginity is a made-up concept, and they basically mock it and say that you know, children should be able to experience any type of sexual whatever they want, and it's just it's pathetic. And that stuff is what's some of the stuff that's trying to get into our schools. That's why we as parents need to watch what's being in our schools, pornographic materials in the libraries. There's a lot of information. Bart can give you on that if you want to research that and see that's if in your kids' schools. They only point out the hard cases like rape, incest, endangering the life of the mother, mental health of the mother, or birth defects. 96.5% of abortions are actually performed for social or economic reasons. What that means is they don't want the responsibility or the consequences or the inconveniences of having a baby. That is not a good reason to kill a baby. It never is. Or it's not a baby, it's just a cell tissue or a fetus. They even try to, to get away from that. And here's the last lie. They don't ever mention the risks of abortion. Here's some of the risks of abortion. Medical complications, heavy bleeding, infection, incomplete abortions, sepsis, damage to the cervix, scarring of the uterine lining, uterine perforation, damage to internal organs, even death, psychological complications, relationship problems, guilt, depressions, eating disorders, flashbacks of the abortion, suicidal thoughts, sexual dysfunction, alcohol and drug abuse, drug abuse. and then later on in life, a high risk of breast cancer, cervical, ovarian, and liver cancer, pelvic inflammatory disease, and the inability to have children in the future. Getting back to one of the heroes of the faith, Mother Teresa, listen to this. Abortion kills twice. It kills the, mo the body of the baby, and it kills the conscience of the mother. Abortion is profoundly anti-woman, Mother Teresa. Well put. But... As Bob said earlier, as I'm saying these things, it might be for, there might be some that are hearing his sitting in here or watching on TV like this, this is hitting them hard. Like, whoa, pastor, you're making me feel terrible. I, I, I don't like what you're saying. My goal is not to make you to feel terrible. My goal is to share the truth as from God's word. But I want you to know, as Bob was trying to tell us earlier, God loves you. He loves everybody. No matter what we've done, he can offer forgiveness and he can forgive, offer healing. Jesus said it this way, come to me, all you who labor and carry heavy burdens and I will give you rest. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He says, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Jesus and this church are here to help anyone who has been affected by abortion. We are not here to judge, but to love and to help you. And I just want to reiterate that. We're here to love you, and we're here to help you. I love the way Bob put it. Every one of us are sinners. Every one of us have done things that we're not proud of, that we wish we could take back. But God offers forgiveness. He loves us so much. He wants to just wrap your arm, his arms around you, and he allows the church to be a part of that, and that's what we want to be. In verse 8, it says, Now there arose a new king after Egypt who did not know Joseph. This is a real turning point in the story because everything's great in Egypt until Joseph is gone and a new king comes in. You know what? And the knowledge that Joseph and, and God was not, uh, the greatness of God all of a sudden is not in the land anymore. And this is something to think about. When our faith isn't passed on to the next generation, whether it's a country or in the family, don't expect to have the blessings of God after that faith isn't passed on that you had before it. I'm remindful of in Judges where it says 
that the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen the great works of the Lord, which he had done for Israel. But when that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose them who did not know the Lord, nor the work which he had done for Israel. And the next thing it says, the whole book of Judges says this, then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. But then you have this king who you can tell he's kind of a, he's kind of a panicky guy. He's like most, most dictor, dictators and tyrannical leaders are like this. When they see any type of threat to their kingdom, they get very upset. And that's exactly what this guy does. And now he wants to deal shrewdly with them. He wants to, to put them into slavery thinking it'll, it'll just um, not allow them to grow. But you know what? God uses that. Just like in the book of Acts as we've been reading on um, on, uh, on Wednesday night, that when the affliction, the persecution came on the church, the church started to grow. And what do we see here? Verse 12, but the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. Guys, affliction is something none of us like, but affliction is used of the Lord for actually a lot of good purposes. Joseph, Hannah, David, and so many other biblical characters, because of the afflictions they went through, they were put in a place to be used by God. Psalm 119.50 says, This is my comfort in my affliction. Your word has given me life. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. It is good for me that I've been afflicted, that I may learn your word. And that's what's happening here. God is blessing these people in the midst of their affliction. But I just started looking at this, and this, this is, they're basically being persecuted. And it just reminded me, guys, we need to pray for the persecuted church. There are, there are believers that are getting killed and just abused and just so many evil things happening to them in other parts of the world, which may come to our country, we never know, but we've always got to be praying for them and also praying for us. And then he tells the, the Hebrew midwives in verse 15 and 16, if they have a baby and it's a son, kill it. How heartless can you be that you would do that? Well, I think the enemy's always behind that. In fact, the Lord says in, verse, in Proverbs 6, he hates a heart that devises wicked plans like he's doing. He hates feet that are swift in running to evil. Those are people that run or, or try to push others to get abortion. And he hates hands that shed innocent blood. He hates that. That's what God does. He hates it. Albert Einstein said, life is sacred. That is to say, it is the supreme value of all other values of subordinate. And as you know and I know, the devil is always behind the taking of innocent life. And Jesus put it this way, the thief or the devil does not come except to steal and to kill and destroy. But Jesus says, but I, I have come that you would have life and have it more abundantly. The big, that's why I told you, that was one of the verses I talked about last week about my own personal top 10 verses. Every Christian should know this. John 10, 10. It tells us the difference between the darkness and the light and the good and the evil. It's the enemy and it's the Lord. And we need to know that. I saw this quote, every man's life is a plan of God. Think about that. Every man's life is a plan of God. Every life that is breathing, God has a plan for that baby. Everyone. And it's not just, it's not just a taking of a life. You know what it says he comes to steal and kill and destroy? It's not just to kill the life. It's to steal this baby out of the arms of God who has a plan for that baby. Every baby God has a plan for. I, saw, I just thought this in my head. This is kind of a, when my wife and I were dating, we had a bunch of different songs. And this one song, I've never heard it except from when we were dating. But I couldn't help thinking of the lyrics. And, it told, and the lyrics are how amazing a great life is. And it says, life is precious, life is sweet. Like the earth beneath my feet. Though I know I'm passing through, I know I belong to you. Life is precious, life is sweet. And this truth makes it complete. Knowing Jesus died for me, life is precious, life is sweet. Guys, life is a blessing. And it's being snuffed out. And, and it's, it's just a terrible evil that's going on. So this king has them do all this stuff. Bad news, right? Bad news. But verse 17 says, but. I like when you put that in there. Also, the story's going this way. It says, but. The midwives feared God. I love that. But the midwives feared God. There was someone that was not going to go along with that evil plan. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. The fear of the Lord, by the fear of the Lord, one departs from evil. 
I would like to see instead, and not just that the, but the midwives feared God, but the church feared God. But Impact Bible Fellowship feared God. But you or I, put your name in there, but you feared God, but I feared God to the point that we do something about it. God is a God of action. He doesn't want us just to put our head in the sand, which really the church has been doing for a long time. He's wanting us to be a part of what he's doing. So what did these midwives do that was so amazing? They did not do as the king of the Egypt commanded them. These brave women acted on their God-given conscience. And this is a place, actually, where civil disobedience is warranted, if you will. When the government tells you to do something that's flat-out evil and you say no, that's civil disobedience, that's honoring God. It says in Proverbs 24, 11, deliver those who are drawn toward death and hold back those stumbling to the slaughter. That's what this whole thing is about. That's what the pro-life of movement is all about. They're not looking for a fight. They're protecting life that's being snuffed out and taken and all these girls are being lied to and a culture that's being lied to. You know, God designed sex. Did you know that? And it's a beautiful thing his way in marriage, between a committed husband and a committed wife together forever. It's awesome. Outside of that, it's sin. It's disobedience. But the word will tell you anything's okay with the Lord. But God knows the heartache and the pain and all that's not going to be good like you think it is. But that's God's plan. But it says, but save the male children alive. And I start thinking of these two ministries that we're trying to help. Love Life Ministry, Riverside Life Services, Love Life Ministry, as Bob was saying, they do prayer walks. We're going to go on this one this Saturday. I'd love to see you guys all go there. We're going to be there. They also have prayer ministry slots where you can pick a, a time during the week when they're open that you can actually just pray. And they have a little uh, on, online, they have some different things to pray about. They have sidewalk counselors. There's opportunities for mentor and discipleship. There's opportunities for foster care and adoption. There's a house of refuge like we are. Then there's Riverside Life Services with our friend Chelsea here. She works there. They have pregnancy tests, ultrasound, counseling and mentorship, support groups, material needs for mothers, diapers, babies, clothes, all kinds of things, Bible studies, discipleship, education, life skill class classes. These two organizations are all about helping these precious women and the children and the families that are affected by it. And we too, in our Christian lives, there's going to be time where we have to do like they said in the book of Acts. We, it's better to obey God than it is to, be, to obey man. In the book of Acts, Peter and John got arrested for preaching the gospel. Then they got beaten and they got warned, don't ever do that again. And you know what they said? It's better for us to obey, a God, to obey God than you. They were talking about saving lives through the gospel. They were talking about saving the lives of babies. But you know what? That's not where it stops. We want those babies and those mothers and everybody to be saved by the message of the gospel so that they could go to heaven too. And the devil hates that. And he's always going to fight against that. Look at verse 18. Why have you done this thing and saved the male children alive? Uh, duh. It's murder, king. You know, he's, he's just like, he's all, why? Why? Why would you? And there's probably people looking at us like, why are you so passionate about life? Hello, it's life. I mean, it's kind of like a no-brainer, but people actually look at you like, well, why? Why are you so passionate about this? What would you answer? What would the answer be to you if someone asked you, why are you so passionate about life? Here's a couple thoughts. To take an innocent life is murder. That's one reason. It's an innocent life. They haven't done anything wrong. They don't deserve it. Number two, every life is of value to God. Every single life is of value to God. Life is precious in his sight. God decides the day of a person's death, not man. Did you know that? God's the one in control, not us. Man is made in the image of God. Babies are image bearers of the king, and they're just starting out. And you have no idea what a blessing a life can be to others and to the world. There's so many stories of people that the attempt was to abort them, and the mom changed her mind, or they tried an abortion, but then she changed her mind after it, and took the right medication or things to try and right the ship. And these people are so blessed by these babies. Or some of these babies grow up to be absolute blessings and they were almost on the verge of being snuffed out. But I love how what they say, I, I love that what they say in verse 19. The Hebrew women are not like the, the Egyptian women for they are lively. What he's, you know, it's, 
And she's, she's kind of like putting a play on words like, like, gosh, by the time we get to them, the baby's already delivered. I can't do anything. And then it's gone, you know? It's like, but here to me is the deeper meaning. The Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. Didn't I just say that in, in the Bible, Egypt is a, is a uh, type of the world? You know what that's saying? The Hebrew women, the godly women are pro-life. The Egyptian women, they aren't. They could care less about life. Well, especially Pharaoh. I don't know about the women, but that's what he's saying. We care about life is basically what she is saying. And God gave them wisdom on how to respond to evil king. I love that. And, uh, and God's favor was on them. Look at this verse 20. Therefore, God dealt well with the midwives and the people multiplied and grew very mighty. So often, guys, when we stand for life or what's right, we always maybe can be a little fearful or what are they going to say or what are the repercussions or I might lose my job or all these little stupid things that the devil throws in our head like fear. And God says, I'm going to take care of you. You honor me, I am going to bless you. I'm going to take care of you. Don't ever let doing the right thing make you think, should I do the right thing? No, do the right thing and watch God show up and watch bless. And it says in, um, and the people multiplied and grew very mighty. Let me ask you a question. What if the Hebrew women weren't brave? What if they didn't step up? We have no guarantee that anybody else would have stood up. It talks about these, there's actually two names, and some would think that those maybe were the two women that were overseeing all of the midwives. Like maybe they coordinated or something. I don't know, you know. But God blessed these because these women stood up. Verse 21 says, and so it was because, that's another word, because, that's like the word but. It's like this terrible thing was happened, but this happened, and because of that, this is what God did. We just read that in verse 19. Now look at verse 21. And so it was because the midwives feared God that he provided households for them. Isn't that amazing? God provided for them because they did the right thing. God will bless you and I because we do the right thing. And this is one thing you'll hear all the time. Well, you hear it in this pulpit all the time, but you should hear it in every church. God blesses obedience. Did you guys catch that? God blesses obedience, and he loves it when people stand up for what's right and do the right thing. Oh, my gosh, that we would be bold and courageous for the Lord our God and hate the things he hates and love the things that he loves. The Bible says, 2 Chronicles 69, the eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are loyal to him. These women were loyal to the Lord God, and they knew he's a giver of life. He's a creator of life. And they're saying, we're not bowing down to you. Just like those, those three Hebrews in, uh, in Daniel, they would not bow down to the evil King Nebuchadnezzar. They just stood. He goes, we're not bowing, even though everybody else is. And God took care of them. And there was another in the fire. You know the story? When they erected this big statue, and they said, okay, you guys are going to worship this. If not, you're going to go in the fire. The, 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 the statue was the king. Everybody bowed down and worship when they played the, scene, the, the song, except three Hebrews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They probably were just sitting there like, we ain't going to bow, king. And he was so mad, he took them in, he starts interrogating them, and he says, our God is able to deliver us. But even if he doesn't, king, we will not bow down to you. And he threw them in there, and he looks in there, and there was another in the fire that looked like the son of God. And they came out un unburned. God will do that for you and I. He will be the other one in the fire. He will be there to help you. Edmund Burke said this, the only, good, the only necessary thing for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. When good men do nothing, evil just takes off. And we're seeing it more now than ever before. I was so blessed to be here about Pastor Jack Hibbs the other day. He got asked to, to, to give the invocation or the prayer in front of Congress. And they had all these little things. Okay, it can only be 150 words. You can't say the Father. You can't say Jesus, you know. And, and so he's like, okay, how can I word this? He starts writing. He writes it up. And he's on the airplane. And he's like, he looks at it. He goes, I'm sorry, Lord. <laughs> I cannot say this. So he rewrites it all there. And he gets in front of them. And he goes up to the, the microphone in all in front of these, the Congress. And he says, I thank you, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior. Uh, and, and then he starts talking. I'm sitting there talking to the microphone. And he goes, <laughs> and so, 
And so he, t- he starts asking for forgiveness for their sins, that us of, in the United States will repent of our sins, that these, le- these legislators, we know that they're put there by God, and they're, they're there to protect and help and all this stuff. And, and he just like lays it out there. Well, now he gets all these people complaining, uh, and some of them are atheists. And I thought, it's kind of funny, he goes, if an atheist is complaining about me praying to God, they shouldn't worry about it because there's no God, right? I mean, hello. But anyways... I, I admire and love the boldness that he had. And that's what we need to do. We need to, when we get our opportunity to speak the truth, not in a, not in a, a condescending or an arrogant way, but in love, we got to share the truth of what God has put in our hearts. Are you guys with me? You know what I'm saying? Every one of you has a different circle of influence. Every one of you may be at work or a family gathering or on the little league field or wherever, and there, a conversation hap- comes up. And you have the opportunity to lovingly speak truth. See, that's the problem is because nobody speaks truth, everybody thinks the truth isn't really real or so they're, they're just all kind of cowering. But have you ever heard this? If you're contagious, no, I'm sorry, I just say it back. If you're courageous, you're contagious. <laughs> I think I better work on that one. But if you're courageous, it's contagious. Other people are like, wow, he said that, she said that. Yeah, you know, and all of a sudden you get people that want to do that. And that's what we need to do. We need to be people that love the Lord and are willing to stand up for him. And then it closes in verse 22. So Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every son who is born you shall cast into the river, and every daughter you shall save alive. It's like Pharaoh's kind of like, okay, I can't get these Hebrews to get on board. I'm just going to tell my people, you guys kill every male. Isn't that just sick? That's actually demonic is what it is. But it's also a reminder to us, guys, okay, we had this, this great moment where she sticks up, the, 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 wind, the, the midwives stick up for the Lord. They have bravery. They have courage. They won't bow down. God blesses all the, the Hebrew nation and everything. And, and everything. Or, but then this Pharaoh, all of a sudden, he just keeps doing evil. And there was a great victory there. But this is a reminder that evil is always going to be there. Even though God blessed the Hebrew midwives, the battle still goes on. And that's what my brother Todd read out of the book of Matthew that the evil King Herod, he took all the males two years and under in Bethlehem and killed them because the Messiah was coming through. And that's the sad truth, the sad reality, is there's evil forces even today that are still trying to kill babies and everything. Even though Robert's way was struck down, the enemy is rearing his ugly head again in many ways right now. Often, um, I'll meet with a bunch of the elders and Pastor Rick and we'll have breakfast and we'll talk about the things of the church and stuff. And often I'll drive right, because it's really close, I'll drive right by the abortion clinic. And there was a time or two where there was a counselor's out there, and I was like, yeah, you know, I'd roll down the window and say something and pray for him. But there's a lot of times I drive by and there's nobody there. Nobody, no Christians. And these cars are going in there to have their baby killed. It just breaks my heart. And like, and my prayer is that our church and other churches would get in the battle And we would be the people that pray, and we would go in these prayer boxes. We would take the prayer slot. Some of us would be sidewalk counselors. Some of us would be mentors, and some of us are. But I'm praying the church would get in in there, and then we would answer Bob's prayer request to buy a stack of plywood and shut that thing down and button up that building so there's no more babies killed in in our city. Are you with me? So we need to pray for these two organizations, Riverside Life Services and Love Life, and then for our city. And as we close, I just want to read a couple of verses on life and just let the Lord speak. It says about Jesus, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. John 1, 4. I am the bread of life, Jesus said, John 6, 35. John 10, 10, I read this earlier. The thief or the devil does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly, John 10, 10. John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Romans 6, 23, the gift of God is eternal life. Job 33, 4, the Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. I love that. Proverbs 12, 28, the way of the righteous is life. And its pathway, in its pathway, there is no death. And then the book of Revelation, 
We talk about eating from the tree of, the light, of life, drinking from the water of life, and our names are written in the book of life. You guys with me? Life is precious, but there's a devil that hates it. But you know what? Greater is he, than, uh, he that's in us than he that's in the world. And let's take these opportunities that God has given us to be able to make a difference in this kingdom, whether it's be a person of prayer or want to volunteer in some of those things with the sidewalk counselors, or just being a voice and speaking up when you get a chance to talk with people. Maybe you're at a family gathering or something, and a topic comes up. Stand up with love and compassion, but stand in truth. The Bible says to speak the truth in love. We need to always speak truth in love. The Bible says in these last days, we're to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. That means we need to speak in a way of the truth where we're not standing arrogant, we're not condescending, but we're saying it in a way that we're praying that they can be received. Always be praying that, God, you show me how to speak with wisdom and how to speak with love so I can share the truth. Amen? As the worship team comes up here, why don't you bow your heads for a word of prayer. Oh, Father, we thank you for your word, Lord. Your word is so rich to us. We're thankful what you shared. Even thousands of years ago, this evil that was happening back in Egypt and then happened in Bethlehem is still happening today, Lord. We pray for these two organizations, uh, Love Life and Riverside Life Services, that you would bless everyone there. All of those that are in leadership, Lord, give them godly vision to lead that ministry properly. All of their employees, Lord, fill them with your Holy Spirit. Help them to be all in for you and protect them from the attacks of the enemy. And Lord, we pray that many women in our city would, would save their or keep their babies. And not only that, but they come to faith in the, to the living Savior, Jesus Christ. And Lord, maybe today as we're sitting here praying, some have, have come in here and, and maybe their hearts are, are heavy. And maybe they're hearing these things and, and you've never given your life to Jesus. You're not sure if you were to die, if you would go to heaven. You may have this guilt or this shame or this remorse. I want you to know God loves you and he cares about you. And I want to just say a little prayer. And if you want to pray this, pray it with me. A, a prayer of asking for God's forgiveness, inviting him to be your Lord and your Savior and to come into your life and then to turn from sin and follow him. And you will have such a blessed life that you will have life and that more abundantly. If that's you, just repeat this prayer after me. If you want Christ to come into your life, Dear Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I am sorry for things I've done. But I know that you love me. And that you died on the cross for my sins. And you rose again from the dead. I want to follow you all the days of my life. I promise to turn from my sins and to follow you to the best of my ability. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to follow. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, if that's you, we'd love to meet with you. Pastor Rick and some of the elders will be back there. We also have ladies that would love to meet anybody that uh, gave their life to Christ. Or if you have questions about what it means to be a Christian or if you need prayer, we also have a cross here and sometimes we have our elders over there. I think Alan and Trish might be over there. Uh, we have many people to, to give, to, to pray with you. So we're going to have a worship song, and then we're going to break down chairs, and we're going to go eat. I'll come up right after the song and pray for the meal, and then we'll go from there. But let's stand up and have a final worship song. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand, when everything around me shaking. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. He's
Can you hear me now? Oh, I had it on all the time. You guys didn't hear me singing, did you? Oh, you're still here. You must not have heard me. <laughs> hey, I said I was going to pray for the meal. We're going to pray for the meal out there, but I want to pray for everybody before we go. But my wife and I will be available at the cross if anybody needs prayer. You know, like I said, Pastor Rick's back there with Bibles and everything. But um, if we could get all the chairs and everything picked up quick and put away so we could all go out there and pray for the meal. But everybody, I want you to come. Maybe some of you didn't even know it was a potluck, or maybe this is your first time here. Come and join us. This is for everybody, all right? Lord, we thank you uh, for who you are. I pray for your blessing upon every single person here. Lord, fill us with your spirit. Help us to be those people that aren't ashamed of you, that are willing to speak truth and use our lives to, to be a blessing to others. So bless our families and our fellowship today. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.